My name is Serge, and I'm an independent internet researcher up in the great white Canadian north. It's normally a pretty boring job. I study online trends for retail companies so they can tailor their algorithms and such. Not the most exciting job in the world, but it pays pretty well. But for the past year or so, I've been putting a lot of professional and spare time into a fairly recent internet phenomenon known colloquially as catfishing. For those who aren't aware, catfishing is a deceptive activity where a person creates a sock puppet presence or fake identity on a social networking service and is often employed for romance scams on dating websites. The practice may be used for financial gain, to compromise a victim in some way, or simply as forms of trolling. The client I've been in the employ of for the past years, one of the larger dating apps that has risen in prominence, in the hopes that my research will prevent the phenomenon from occurring, since fear of becoming a victim has caused their traffic to stagnate over recent years, and understandably so. I've been working on a comprehensive guide to catfishing and how to avoid it, but for now, I'll tell you some stories I've gleaned from interviews with people who have come forward as a result of advertisements I've put up online. These are some of the scariest catfishing stories I've compiled. I interviewed a young woman from the United States who says that she met what seemed like the perfect guy online. They did it for over a year and spent months talking online before they met in person. When they did, she was introduced to his parents, slept in his apartment, met a circle of friends, the works. Then suddenly, one day, he randomly disappeared. The girl, who I'll not name, paid hundreds of dollars to an online private investigator service and after months of research, they discovered something horrifying. The man had given her a false name and had done so to many, many other girls online. But the reason that he had disappeared was that he had been sent to prison on manslaughter charges. One of the other girls that he had been involved with had died as a result of some sort of kinky game that they'd been playing, and he was subsequently tried and convicted of the crime in a federal court. I remember her crying when she said it could have been her, that they had discussed that kind of activity and were only a matter of months from trying it. I spoke to another girl over Skype about her experiences with her catfish. One might assume that most catfish victims are men who are being romantically scammed out of their finances, but it's actually quite untrue. Women and girls seem to be the most susceptible, but this is a so far unsubstantiated conclusion that requires much more evidence and many more examples for me to prove it conclusively. Anyway, the girl I spoke to was in her early 20s, was very petite and had done some modeling work with the hopes of making it an actual career. When a model who called herself Jasmine reached out to her with some advice regarding the industry, she thought it might have been her big break. Jasmine appeared to be experienced and well-connected and proved to be a constant source of inspiration and motivation for her. They ended up becoming good friends, and when Jasmine clued her into a lingerie shoot that was apparently working for a company based out of Milan, Italy, the girl was incredibly thankful and grateful for such an opportunity. However, when it came to the day of the photo shoot, Jasmine didn't show up. The girl I interviewed was very disappointed but was assured by her so-called friend that a relative had passed away suddenly. She was alone but the photographer was friendly and welcoming and they continued with the shoot as planned. She was paid rather handsomely and actually returned to the studio twice after to do some similar photo shoots. But the last time she did, her attire and theme of the photo shoot didn't sit right with her. She told me it was verging on raunchy, which, if you catch my drift, was unusual, since a lot of the clothes were what she described as innocent looking. This did raise some suspicion, but again, she was paid generously. Around 18 months afterward, the girl read of a photographer who had been convicted of producing and sharing lewd images of children online that he had used the persona of a fictional girl to lure women into photo shoots and sold the photographs under the pretext that they were of underage girls. Whilst not strictly illegal, it did take long for the photographer to venture into actual illegality and it was over this that he was convicted of a crime. She felt sick that her image had been used in such a way, sold to degenerates who in turn must have done some very unsavory things with them. But it's this last catfish story that I'll pass on to you that I think disturbs me the most. 
I ended up talking to a girl via a throwaway Skype account that I initially thought was actually trying to catfish me. Since she refused to provide any personal details about herself or any evidence that she was genuine, it'd be pretty dumb of me to get catfished while investigating the subject itself, right? But as I was saying, I met a girl who claimed to be an actual catfish, or rather that she had once partaken in the activity when she was much younger and internet chat rooms were still relatively new. She claimed to have met a young European man who was a few years older than her, and they had begun a kind of online relationship. They swapped pictures, and things escalated from there until they eventually began a series of phone conversations from across the Atlantic. She had given a false name, and said she suspected he had done the same since, back then, internet safety was something people worried about. As the relationship escalated, the European boy talked about flying over to the United States to meet her. There was only one problem. The girl had lied about her age. She was 15 at the time and had actually sent him a picture of a girl that was not her. In order to try to find a way out, she somehow convinced the boy that she had been in a car crash, had lost both her legs as a result, and was struggling with her memory. In short, she basically told him she had no memory of him or of their conversations and pretended that new girl, for want of a better term, had no interest in meeting a total stranger from Europe. The boy then went quiet. Now, I don't know how true this is, as the only piece of evidence she was able to provide was a newspaper article from a Belgium newspaper detailing about the man actually taking his life over that because of a breakup with an online girlfriend. She swore to me that it was the same young man, insisting it was his name, his pictures, the works. But as I said... I can't substantiate her claims due to her lack of willingness to identify herself. But if it is true, then that is a terrifyingly bleak result of such an affair. If not, then I wonder what kind of psychopath would fabricate such a detailed, disturbing story. Still, I hope these stories have given you some kind of insight into the techniques and protocols of those who wish to use the internet to deceive you. Practice internet safety take everything with a pinch of salt, and be very, very careful with who you talk to online. Hopefully some of you dudes out there will learn a thing or two because this is less of a story than a straight up warning. I met this awesome girl in Tinder, we vibed for a few days, then arranged to meet up the following week. I wanted to impress her, so we arranged to uh, meet at a super fancy restaurant. She also hinted that she liked jewelry, so me being the generous soul that I am, bought her a fancy gold wrist tie thing. I forget the name of them, but it was expensive. So yeah, we arranged the date, and on the night of, I end up waiting outside this super fancy place in a shirt and tie, looking like Dwight from The Office or something. I just felt dumb. Anyway, I get a text from her saying she was going to be late and that she'd lost her bank card, so could I, like, cover her half of the bill? No worries, I think. So I walk to a nearby ATM to take out a little extra cash, as well as a generous tip for whatever server ended up serving us. Gotta show off that generous side, right? I walk back to the place, text her, and she says she's so sorry, but she's going to be even later than she first thought. Again, I'm like, no worries. She was way hot enough to wait for. She had this amazing smile, cute brown eyes, and from the gym selfies she put on her profile, you could see it from the front, if you know what I mean. Anyway, things start getting a little annoying when she texts me and she says she can't find the restaurant, and can I meet her further down the street so we can walk there together? Of course, I'm going to say yes. No way I'm going to just say no and walk back home. So, I do as I'm asked, and walk further down the street to a quieter part of the neighborhood in order to keep an eye out for her. A few minutes go by and there's still no sign of her. I'm starting to worry that she won't show and I start getting that sinking feeling where I'm scared that I'm going to get stood up. But my eyes light up when I see her name on my phone, saying she's waiting in a nearby parking lot because she doesn't feel safe walking up to meet me alone. I got that, I totally did. She was probably wearing something super fancy, some sort of dress and heels, but I get to the parking lot, 
and I start getting a bad feeling. It's super dark, pretty much deserted with only a few cars parked around the edges, and it's actually way off from the main connecting roads so that walking into the place, I'd be pretty much alone and out of sight. But I'm thinking with my other head, you dig? So I can only really blame myself when that lily white meth head put a gun in my face. I thought it was just a random robbery at first, but when they demanded I turn over the jewelry, I knew what had happened. It was those guys, the whole time that had completely catfished me, built me up, then smashed me down in the worst way possible. Not only was I down like $600 in cash and jewelry, but I had got into my head that this girl, this totally fictional girl, was like the love of my life. I think that hurt more than just losing the money. You can get the money back, but not the self-worth, the self-esteem. So be careful out there, my guys, and be super, super careful when meeting strangers online. I think we can all agree that lockdown has been incredibly boring. I, a 24-year-old male, have been learning Italian. My mom is so proud since her people are Napolitano. Learning how to cook, working out a whole lot more, and, like many of you, dipping a toe into the local dating pool. My weapon of choice has been that relatively new dating app, Hinge. It's by far the best I've used since it seems to have an equal focus on look and personality. That dumb questions prompt might seem that way, but they really give you an insight into a person's character. But anyway, I was having fun with it, just chatting with girls and playing it cool until I matched with a girl who I won't name because I'm kind of worried she might read this. I know for a fact she's a Redditor, so forgive me if I just call her the girl. So the girl had some really cute pictures in her profile, as well as some really nice answers to the prompts. From what I could tell, she was into fitness, she was creative, a good sketch artist from her photos, and was very, very pretty. So obviously, I sent her a message complimenting her art and hoping that would draw her attention away from the thirstier guys who lack tack and sophistication. No offense, thirsty dudes, but you need to work on that. We get chatting for a while and we have a lot in common. I was super excited about the prospect of meeting her and Obviously, she felt the same about me, so the very next day, when she asked me to go for a walk around the local park with her, I jumped at the chance. I was kind of nervous waiting to meet her, doing that thing like rubbernecking, looking all around and hoping to see the gorgeous girl from the photos walking towards me. As I'm waiting, another girl walks up to where I'm sat near this water fountain, wearing shades and a baseball cap, and starts looking at me. I kind of look at her and give a look like, why are you staring at me, while she just smiles. Hi Campbell, she says, and only then did the penny drop. The girl's pictures made her look clear-skinned, athletic, slender, and petite. But this girl, who was obviously the one I've been talking to, was the exact opposite. I don't want to be cruel, I won't say mean things about her, but... She was not who she had made herself out to be. I had been thoroughly catfished. Like I said, I'm not a complete jerk. I did promise this girl a date, and a date I did give her. She did make it clear at one point that she had put on a little weight during quarantine, but she made no excuse for the heavy acne she had. I mean, I sympathize with skin problems because I had a little eczema myself, but maybe just be honest about it, you know? I'd have swiped anyway. But either way, we find ourselves a little spot among some trees and get chatting. It's only really then that I got annoyed at how she talked me up. She claimed to love sci-fi movies and stuff, but the more we talk, the more it was clear that she didn't know anything about the stuff that we talked about. She kept getting her Star Wars and Star Trek references mixed up, which was my first major clue, and it only got worse from there. After an hour or so of this, with me trying to stay as polite as physically possible... We agreed to walk back home, parting ways at a neutral point. We hugged. I said I'd see her again, which I felt guilty for lying, but hey, I was thoroughly annoyed at that point. And then we parted ways. Okay, so 
You know people talk about getting like a gut feeling of being watched or followed? No idea what they're talking about because as I walked home, fairly disappointed from what was a washout date, I got absolutely zero inclination that anything unusual was happening. I didn't feel eyes on me. I didn't get any like sixth sense or gut feeling. I just walked home, laid on the couch, and texted a buddy of mine telling him about the little dating disaster I just suffered through. He laughed, helped me see the funny side, told me how I should be flattered and that it meant I'd obviously hook up with someone else soon since I was a total ogre. The girl texted me asking if I wanted to meet again the next day, but I just sort of ignored the message. I know that's kind of low of me, but anyway. The next day I'm just chilling playing Xbox when my phone buzzes with a message. Want to meet up in the park again? It was the girl. I told her some nonsense about being tired and too busy with work or whatever and that I'd drop her a message as soon as I was next free. She replies with the following, It's okay if you're tired. I can meet you at your place and we can chill in your apartment. I had absolutely zero memory of telling her where I lived. I didn't hint at it. I didn't clue her into any kind of location whatsoever. So how did she know where I lived? I don't remember telling you where my apartment building is, I reply. Don't worry about that. And she gives me a winky face. I'm smart, remember? I felt sick. There was only one solid explanation for why she knew where I lived. She had somehow followed me home without me spotting her, which I'm sure I don't have to tell you why that was some serious line crossing a huge breach of trust for me. I left her on red and immediately called my ex to get her advice on it. She didn't pick up right away, but she called me back later in the afternoon, as was quick to advise me to just block her, ghost her, and never look back. In her words, if she was this quick to get clingy and stalkerish, then there was only worse to come. So cut to like two weeks ago. It's late, I'm hungry, and I've ordered takeout delivery from the local taco place. I get a message from an unknown number like, outside. That's all it said. So obviously I go down to the front door of my apartment building expecting to see a delivery driver with my order. We have a big solid door, no little windows, no peepholes, nothing like that. So I'm just all chill, excited to stuff my face with El Pastor. The door swings open and it's the girl and she looks livid. How dare you? You think you can just ghost me? You lied to me. Blah, blah, blah. I immediately freak out and just slam the door in her face. I run up to my apartment and lock the door behind me, but she wouldn't leave. Like it got to the point where one of my neighbors got into a confrontation with her because of the whole social distancing thing. In the end, they did me a huge favor and they called the cops. The girl gets a fine advised to move along, which thankfully she does, but I'm so nervous she'll come back. Like really, really nervous to the point of terrified because if she's that unstable, she's likely to do me harm at one point, right? If you guys have any advice or experience in anything like this, please let me know. I'd be super appreciative of anything you can offer in terms of any sort of direction. So as you know, girls, dating can be super fun, but super risky. I'm sure you all have your guards up when meeting guys for the first time, especially when it comes to dating apps. And after one chance encounter with a guy I met on Tinder, I keep a double guard up these days, and here's why. I happened across the profile of a guy claiming to be a male model. The pictures were super hot. The guy looked like he was a Viking or something. Tall, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, a real-life Disney prince. Not just that, but he was incredibly charming, had all the right answers to all of my questions, and by the end of our first day chatting, I was so ready to meet him. So we arranged a little meet, a little cute thing at a local eatery, a Korean BBQ place that I'd been dying to go to. Of course, he'd promised to pay for everything, and I'm not a freeloader, but let's just say that I like the gentlemanly touch. He was late, 
Now, I know that might seem irritating, but the anticipation of waiting for the guy was intoxicating. I didn't quite feel worthy of him, and being made to wait only compounded the feeling. By the time five minutes after our proposed meeting time had passed, I had serious butterflies in my stomach. I never anticipated what would come next, not in my wildest dreams, and when it did, I felt sick to my stomach. I look up from my phone to see someone recording me on their own device. This guy was no viking. He was short, overweight, unshaven, and he looked like he hadn't bathed in weeks. I asked him what he thought he was doing filming me like that, and his response pretty much knocked the wind out of me. This wasn't exactly what was said, but just what I can recall from memory. You see? You see how unfair this is? You can pick up any guy you want, but I have to lie just to get you to meet me. That's disgusting. You should have been giving a guy like me a chance. You honestly think you deserve a male model. You're not even that hot. He's saying this so loud that the entire restaurant is looking around at us, and I can feel all eyes staring at me, at us. It reminded me of the middle school play I had to perform in, the same one that had me running off the stage and puking in the girls' bathroom because I just couldn't handle the pressure, the gross amounts of attention. It was kind of weird what happened next. I mean, maybe I'd just grown up a whole lot. Maybe it was the fight-or-flight instinct that had me settling squarely on fight. But the words came out of me before I could even really consider them. I told him what he was doing was not okay, that lying was not the way to get a woman, and that he had a lot of maturing and growing to do before he could be in any decent place to pursue getting a girlfriend. I told him what he did was unfair, not what I was doing, and that he should be ashamed of himself. And I totally turned it around. I was actually shaking with adrenaline, beaming with pride as someone in the back of the restaurant shouted something like, You tell him, girl. I gathered up my purse, got up from my seat, and walked past the guy without giving him a second look. Now, maybe this isn't as scary as a story to you guys as the obsessive stalker or the murderous incel, but for a few moments, it was the most terrifying experience of my life. Two thousand nineteen was probably the worst year of my life. I met a guy at a New Year's party in two thousand eighteen. You know, one of those kissed at midnight deals that has butterflies doing loop to loops in your stomach. He was tall, dark, handsome, every girl's dream. We swapped numbers, went on a few amazing dates, and after about a month of us hanging out and sleeping together, he asked me to be his girlfriend. Of course I said yes, how could I not? He was everything I ever wanted. But time has a funny way of proving you wrong, doesn't it? And if crystal balls existed and I had the capacity to peer into the murky fogs of one to see my future, I'd have never let him kiss me that night as the clocks ticked over to the new year. I'd have run a mile and never looked back. A few months into our relationship, his true nature came to the forefront. He was abusive, extremely abusive. It was all just verbal at first telling me I was dumb when I got something wrong or said something incorrect. Then he got possessive, getting angry when I met up with or talked to my guy friends. He'd hide my phone, my car keys, my shoes, anything he could to control my behavior or movement. Then it was stuff like my diet. He was obsessed with making me lose weight, so like, I'd buy myself some sweet treats to enjoy after a long day of work, only to find them gone when I got home. Not just throw them in the trash, either. He'd ruin them utterly. I bought a carrot cake from a local organic bakery and instead of just throw it out, he'd pour bleach or some kind of caustic cleaning fluid all over it in the sink, like it was a pure power play. He didn't even try to be sneaky about it. Once he drove me to a gym near our apartment, told me to get out and not to come back until sundown. He expected me to work out for hours on end. I remember just sitting outside the place and crying until one of the trainers there took pity on me and drove me home. Big mistake. He beat the life out of me that night. He didn't just slap me around, I mean, he really beat me senseless. It started as soon as I walked through the door. He would saw me getting out of a random guy's car and just lost it. He beat me in the TV room, 
followed me into the kitchen and slapped me there. Then I tried to hide in the bedroom. He kicked the door in and beat me unconscious. At least that's what I'm assuming happened. I woke up the next morning with blood on my pillow, still in that gym gear he made me buy, and I was too scared to go to the cops. I know they can be a great help these days, and the protocol for dealing with domestic abuse has improved dramatically, but I was just terrified. Eventually, things came to a head. After a particularly vicious argument over a dog, I said it wasn't a good idea, and he blew his top. He put a gun to my temple and pulled the trigger. I think the worst part of the whole cycle was the apologies. I know that seems like a weird thing to say after telling you who almost shot me, but I'm serious. He was damaged, extremely damaged, and the crying and apologies after a fight always made me feel a deep sympathy for him. But enough was enough. I went out and bought him a bottle of liquor, then poured him drink after drink until he passed out comatose. He was full on growl snoring as I packed a bag got in my car and drove to my parents. There was a confrontation with my dad at one point, but the old man scared him off. I don't want to say why, as there's still an ongoing court case in the works involving brandishing a weapon, but yeah, it was over. About a month went by, and I got myself a few dating apps to see if I could find someone new. It was nerve-wracking, it really was, but I found myself a couple of matches that really took my mind off the whole thing. It was the start of a long and arduous healing process, but at least I'd taken the step in the right direction. Both guys I'd match with were like my ideal partners. They seemed caring and kind, thoughtful and intelligent. One was awesome, but the other I was truly smitten with. He said something right, did everything right. He had this kind of fatherly vibe about him that made me think that maybe, just maybe one day, he'd be the right choice to start a family with. When it came time to meet for our first date, I was so excited. For the first time in months, I put on a nice dress, did my makeup perfectly, got my hair done, my nails done, the works. Somehow the guy knew I was into vegan food, or rather, that I wanted to turn vegan. My ex had categorically denied me that option, so the fact that this guy basically encouraged it was like a breath of fresh air. I took an Uber to the place waited outside and felt the butterflies doing backflips in my tummy again, just like they had done a long time before. That's when I saw him, walking down the sidewalk. People were giving him weird looks, darting out of his way and into stores or cafes. It wasn't the guy I'd met online. It was my ex, and he had a knife. I kicked off my expensive new heels and ran, hearing him scream after me as he chased me through the streets. I ran into a bar and begged the staff and security to help me. The big doorman was confused at first, but when he saw my ex tearing towards them with that knife in his hand, he shut and locked the door and the patrons inside. The cops came, he was arrested, and I got so many drinks bought for me that night. But seeing the whole torrid affair unravel before my eyes was just a nightmare. There was never any perfect fatherly guy I dream about. It was a complete fabrication of my ex. He knew me well enough to set up a fake profile that would attract my attention. I mean, he tailored it down to a T. He might have set up a few fake profiles, and I'm pretty sure the other guy was him too because after that night, I didn't get any more messages from him. But all he had to do was put them out there and wait for me to fall for it. Like the idiot I am. So a few years back, I found a shady corner of Reddit where people post adverts for partners to talk about illicit stuff with. For those that don't know, you know, some of those that don't, well, I imagine you're going to skip reading my post to find it. For those that do remain, well, this is my catfish story. I met with this awesome girl, swap a few messages with her, then get talking about the sweet stuff, if you know what I mean. It was awesome. I had such a good time and eventually it came to swapping pictures. She sent me pictures of some absolutely stunning model type girl who, to be fair, I should have been suspicious as things start to get a little heavier and we start swapping pics outside of our skivvies, if you know what I mean. This is the point I kind of lost my mind. I didn't realize how easy it is to get a hold of pictures of these girls online. Yeah, I know how dumb that sounds, but hear me out. 
These pictures were obviously taken at home, mirror selfies, stuff like that. For some reason that convinced me she was real. So when she turns it around and asks me for ones of myself, I took some pictures and sent them to her without a second thought. We carry on swapping pictures and dirty texts for a while and I eventually come clean about who I was. Like my real name, my job, not all the info but a lot. She told me a fair bit about her too which only made me like her more because she said that she was like a teacher and stuff. I like the idea that she worked with kids, like it was a motherly thing that made my affection for her grow. But like a lot of stuff like that, she eventually started getting slower and slower with her replies until they stopped dead one day. I was upset. I was super into this girl, but I get why she ghosted. A lot of girls on those subreddits do after a while, whether it's from shame or just boredom. One day they'll just disappear. So I kind of move on from her, just get past the feeling of loss, I know that sounds dumb, and get on with my life. All until I get an email one day saying something along the lines of, We have compromising photographs of you. Wire $500 to the account below within 24 hours or the photographs will be sent to your family, place of work, and to local authorities. Attached to the email were copies of the pictures I'd sent to the girl. Specifically, the ones without any clothes on. I'd been really, really dumb. I'd not thought about the fact that you could basically ID me from the stuff in the background. I don't want to say what the pictures were exactly or how you identify me from them, but they were pretty compromising. I had no choice. I'd given the girl that I'd met, if it was even a girl at all, enough information to actually be able to send copies of these NSFW pictures to my employer, etc. So I paid it. I paid the money, and as you can imagine, that wasn't the end of it. I sent thousands of dollars to those scammers before I finally had the balls to say enough is enough. I emailed back telling them no, that they could send whatever they wanted to whoever they wanted, and that I'd just deny it or say that someone had hacked my phone. I deleted that account, started a new one, and got rid of my phone and got a new one. All kinds of things to try and put enough distance between me and the pictures I'd taken. And you know what? They didn't send anything to anyone. I expected my boss to call me telling I was fired like any day after that email exchange, but nothing came. I even asked my brother if he had any weird emails come through and he was just like, What? No, why? I was safe, and they were bluffing. But please, learn from this dumb little story, and don't ever, ever send stuff like that or anything of the such to people online. Not unless you want to send out thousands in hush money to some complete and utter psychos. This is the story of the worst thing that ever happened to me. It's the story of how a dream came true turned into a nightmare of how some of the sweetest moments of my life turned into the darkest, most humiliating experiences of my life so far. I'm only young, 19, and I know I have a lot of life to live ahead of me, but nothing, I don't think anything, will be quite as destructive to my psyche as what happened one summer when I was 16 years old. I used to play all-girl lacrosse in school. I noticed that in the US it's like mostly a male sport, which is kind of crazy because over here in the UK, at the school I went to, it was a girl sport. And like with the boys in the States, lacrosse can get really, really bloody intense. Girls get their teeth knocked out with sticks sometimes, their knees smashed, their shins bruised up and down with horrible yellow-purple bruises. It really does get incredibly brutal sometimes. But I loved it. It was like the highlight of my entire week because I was good at it too. I made it on to the girls' first 11 toward the north of the UK playing different schools, we entered a tournament when I was 16, got all the way to the regional finals, and we actually won too. But it wasn't the perfect little story you might expect, because something happened that ruined my entire school life. Scores are neck and neck in the final minutes. Adrenaline is surging. I'm so exhausted I feel like my lungs are about to explode and my thighs are killing me, but I keep going. I keep pushing. I remember stopping for a moment, feeling like I was about to throw up from the exertion, and I saw my big brother at pitch side. My ears were actually ringing. I felt like death warmed up, but the look in his eyes, 
like he was angry and proud and loving and supportive all at once, I couldn't hear him really. There were so many people shouting, but I kind of just knew, don't give up, Rosie. Don't ever, ever, ever give up. And then all of a sudden, I could run again. I felt like I could run and run and never stop. The next thing I know, this pass came in from left field, bounces, I net it, burst forward and shoot. Only as I do, a defender kind of trips over my legs. I fall, she falls, but the ball hits home. The goalie had no bloody chance, it was like a friggin' rocket. And that was that. We'd won. I'd won it for us. The entire game, the entire tour. I was the hero. The actual bloody hero. There was like 20 seconds of play left, but it was no good. There was no coming back for the other team. And when the final whistle went, it was like an explosion of happiness. Our coach ran on, hugged me, tears in his eyes, and that made me cry too. But the whole time this was going on, the girl that had fallen hadn't gotten up. Their coach was fuming that we just carried the last part of the game on without seeing to her. She was rolling around in the dirt and you could tell she was in loads of pain. Turns out she'd broken something. Actually a pretty bad break too, like she'd have a double jointed thumb for the rest of her life. But I didn't care. I'm sorry, I know that sounds horrible, but I couldn't. Lacrosse gets rough and that's just how it is. So anyway, about a week later, I get this Facebook friend request. It's from this absolutely drop-dead gorgeous guy. I mean, he was like a heartthrob level gorgeous, and he was from a school on the other side of the city. I accepted the request, half out of curiosity, half so I could just fawn over the pictures of him on there. But then he drops me this message like, I saw you win that lacrosse game. I was there to watch my cousin play, and I'd love to take you out sometime. You were absolutely amazing. Blah, blah, blah. I swear I blushed so hard I thought my face was about to burst. I tried to be cool about it, told him we should chat for a little bit first before we decided on anything, and we did. And it was lovely. He was such a nice guy. Not like a nice guy, but proper, actual, genuine. Point being, we chatted and ended up swapping some kind of raunchy photos. Now, I'm not stupid, or at least not too stupid, because I sent them and waited until I got the scene notification, then deleted them, so he could, like, see them, but not keep them. Then he just disappears. The Facebook account blocks me. The number on WhatsApp blocks me. He ghosted hard. I felt stupid, putting so much faith in this boy who just turned around and straight up blocked me, like I meant nothing to him. He had some really nice chats, too, about life, about school. He really seemed to just get me. But it was a lie, because the next week in school, everyone was laughing, all the girls anyway, while loads of lads were like, all right, Rosie, how's it going? Up to much this weekend? I didn't get it at all, all this attention for some reason. Then I get told only my close mate had it in her to tell me what the deal was. Someone had sent all these underwear shots I'd taken and sent by Facebook boy to like everyone in our school, even my mates. They had come from some boy's account, one that had been deleted not long after. He hadn't blocked me, he straight up deleted them. It was horrible. I don't want to go into detail about what happened next, but it ended up with my parents getting called into school and within the space of about a fortnight, I'd go from the highest I'd ever been in my life to the absolute lowest. I ended up leaving that school to do my GCSE exam somewhere else, but I just couldn't focus. I failed them miserably, mainly because of the stress. The girl who broke her hand or whatever ended up sending me a message like, ha 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 ha, but nothing else. And it was only then I got the idea that it might have been her that orchestrated the whole thing. I ended up going on to a sixth form college that helped people resit their GCSEs. Weird setup, I know, but it gave me the space to be able to think properly and get over what had happened involving the photos. I passed them in the end and I got my life back on track, but the whole thing was just a knockout blow to that stage of my life. I was like a full year behind everyone else and that was super humiliating for a girl like me who had been a star pupil at one point. I feel a bit better having just written this whole thing out. I know it was dead long and I'm sorry, but if you take away anything from this and it helps you too, then I suppose it's been worth the effort.
I can't tell you my name or where I live, nothing like that, because I did something terrible once, truly terrible, or maybe it wasn't so bad in the grand scheme of things, but when you consider the ending, it was bad, really bad, and I caused it all. When I was 19, I was broke, really broke, and I had expensive tastes. I was into drugs, expensive ones, powders and pills, but no job to speak of. I mean, I made a little cash here and there doing favors for dealers, but that went straight into buying more. Eventually, I had a plan. I was going to catfish someone. So I made a fake dating profile, backed it up with social media, the works. I picked a girl that wasn't, like, too hot, but was cute enough to be believable. I found some girl who posted on that Reddit group, R Gone Mild. This little thing with glasses and bangs... I might have fallen for it if I didn't know I was faking the whole thing. I then took to the dating apps, got myself a bunch of matches, and all hit them up with the same story. I lived a little away from them. I wanted to see them, but I just didn't have the money, explaining that I was broke. Which, as we know, was pretty much the truth. I asked them for enough money to buy a bus ticket or like a train ticket or whatever. Good for them. Most of them, they saw through it like straight away. Most guys just told me to buzz off, called me out on being a scammer or whatever. But one didn't. One actually was dumb enough to believe the whole thing. He was this dumb incel type from California. He sent $100 via Venmo to buy a ticket. But I didn't. I lied and told him he must have sent it to the wrong account. I made a new one, apologized, and promised it would work this time. And it did. He sent me another 100 bucks but he said he wasn't a big earner and he couldn't really afford to send much more. Then came the really messed up part. I had a kind of breakdown and this guy was the only person I could really talk to about being an addict. I confessed everything. Not everything, but enough to tell him I was addicted to stuff and that I'd spent all of that money. So he sent me more. And I couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't string this poor guy along for nothing, so... I broke off the whole thing, just made a clean break, deleted all the social media and just tried to get clean. It was horrible, truly one of the worst experiences of my life, but it only got worse. In the weeks that followed, I heard about something terrible that happened out in California. Again, I don't want to be too specific, but it was a very, very violent thing in which a lot of people died. And when I came to find out who it was that did it, I saw this guy's picture in the news. It was an old picture of him, but it was definitely him. Arrested for a mass murder charge or something. He blamed women. That's how I know it was my fault. And I'm really sorry. I'm just so, so sorry. I didn't mean for anyone to get hurt. I was just stupid and short-sighted and selfish. And I'm just so sorry. And I don't know if I can live with myself anymore. A few months ago, I was due to move in with my boyfriend of four years. I know many couples move in together far earlier than that, but we were very focused on our careers and had taken each stage in our relationship super slow, so we were certain we were doing the right thing. Cue the lockdown. It was a case of either pull the trigger on the move-in thing and get it done as quickly as efficiently as possible, or put it off again for the foreseeable future. I wasn't prepared to do that. I wasn't prepared to spend an entirety of any lockdown stuck in my parents' house, but when we walked about, I discovered something horrendous. He had been seeing a girl on the side, some hippie chick that he had met through his job and told me he didn't want to be together anymore. He told me I was neurotic, career-focused, but to the point of being neglectful and cold-hearted. I was broken from it, but above all, I was angry. I basically told him, like... Screw you. I'm getting all the dating apps. I'm going to find someone better than you. And I did. At least I thought I did. That's how I met this guy, Alex. He lived around the corner from me. I'm talking less than five minutes walking distance. And the more we talked, the more I was amazed that we hadn't bumped into each other before. We'd gone to sister schools, lived on the same street at one point, and had a plethora of similar interests. But when it came to meet... 
I got a little nervous, and here's why. I know this is bad of me, but all of my pictures are with filters or taken from a distance. They do make me look very pretty, and I suppose I am in a sense, but there's something I need to explain. I have really bad acne. I always have since I was a teenager. I have a lot of acne scars up and down my cheeks and forehead, and I get those horrible acne spots that are very, very painful to deal with properly, so basically no choice to leave them be or go through inordinate amounts of pain every morning. I also have a condition known as PCOS, or polycystic ovary syndrome. PCOS symptoms can manifest in different ways. The first is the namesake follicles that can surround your ovaries can make getting pregnant very difficult. Just one of the reasons I thought I'd be alone forever when I was a kid. Another is the excess production of male hormones such as testosterone. This means I get thick black hairs coming out of my chin, sometimes even growing from my nose too. Not like inside my nose, like on my nose. This caused me to be depressed for many, many years. I hated the way I looked, and I'm not always the best at remembering to shave or checking myself out in the mirror for that matter. Anyway, I wore sunglasses and let my hair loose for mine and Alex's first meeting. He was really nice and we took a walk around a local park so as to comply with the daily exercise edicts put out by the British government. We talked about stuff that we cared about, discussed our careers, and although I was still really hung up on my ex, I did really like him. We were only supposed to walk a loop around the park for like an hour, but we walked for much longer than that and ended up sitting on the grass for a while and talking. That's when I decided to bite the bullet, so to speak, take off my sunglasses. They were the overly large kind that covered up more than just the eyes, and tie my hair back so we could really see my face. That's when his face dropped. It felt horrendous, seeing this happy, smiling face and warm gaze turn cold as he looked me over, seeing all the things that I hadn't let him during our little walk. I didn't even need to ask why, as he was looking at me like that, and I just blurted out, I'm worried you think I've catfished you. I said, hearing myself just drained of confidence. I half expected him to at least be a gentleman about it. Nothing about his behavior over the previous few hours made me expect anything else, but his answer made me feel like bursting into tears. You did catfish me. You don't look like your pictures at all. He said, not even bothering to look me in the eyes when he said it. We sat there in silence for a minute or so as I fought to keep back the tears. It was only like a week before I'd suffered through some of the worst heartbreak I'd ever faced, and now it was just compounding on it. I think I should just go, I said, moving to get up to walk away. But he grabbed my wrist hard, keeping me from getting up. You know, you shouldn't do this to people. It's very, very rude, he said tightening his grip on my wrist as he seemed to get angrier and angrier. I'm sorry, is all I could say, feeling myself beginning to tremble. I'm stoic usually. I'm good at controlling my emotions, but I was honestly on the verge of cracking up in that moment. I looked around, hoping might see someone that could help me if he started to get really, really angry. But to my absolute horror, there was no one. The sun was beginning to dip in the sky and the park had almost completely emptied of people, worried they'd be fine for being outdoors without a good reason. It was that exact moment that I realized that I was almost completely at the mercy of this angry, obviously unstable guy. The way his mood just swung like that, it was awful. He was not the person I thought he was and that terrified me. Girls like you are the reason dating apps are complete garbage, he growled through his gritted teeth. Girls like you are why I hate doing this kind of thing, getting my hopes up only to be disappointed. I apologized over and over again. I told him I didn't mean to make him angry and that I just tried to pick the best photos of myself, but he interrupted angrily, telling me to shut up. I should teach you a lesson, he spat. Let's take some actual photos of you, shall we? Let's take some pictures so we can show guys what you really look like. I couldn't believe it, but he actually tried to reach for my pocket where I was keeping my phone. I just reacted. I don't know if it was the fear or the anger at being treated like this, 
by someone I barely knew, but I hit him. More like I elbowed him right in the face, and as I did, I heard something crunch. He fell back, letting go of me and bringing both hands to his face in agony. I don't know what I'd broken, what I'd cracked, but I didn't stop to think about it. I stood up and ran away from him. He got up to chase, and in a horrible moment I realized he was gaining on me. But the next time I looked back, he was bent doubled over, handcuffed below his nose as blood poured out of it. He'd stopped chasing me, and it was only then that I burst into tears as I ran. I was an athlete in secondary school and it all just came back to me as I ran and ran and ran and didn't look back. I don't care if my pictures weren't completely representative of me. No one deserves to be talked to or treated like that. Ever. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Be sure to subscribe and click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit or let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video and join my discord to interact with me and other listeners directly and if you want to support me even more grab early access to all future narrations for just one dollar a month on patreon and maybe even pick up some let's read merch on spreadshirt.com and check out the let's read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts all links are down in the description. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, my fursona is a slug.